Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining the Marvel Douglas July webinar. My name is John O'Bowling, and I will be your host this morning. The technology sector has become a prominent feature of an increasingly digitized economy. It also comprises the largest weighting within our Marvel Douglas Global Equity Fund. The sector has rewarded investors handsomely over the past decade. The question on everybody's mind now is, can these returns continue? Or is it a victim of its own success as it succumbs to intensifying regulatory scrutiny like we have seen this week on the Asian markets? To answer these questions, I'm joined by Justin Maloney, our Head of Global Equities, and Zinande, Zinande Miyiwa, our Research Analyst at Marvel Douglas, who covers the tech sector. Before I hand over to Justin, just a few housekeeping rules to guide uh, everyone who's joined us this morning. We'd like to encourage you to ask questions. Questions can be asked by going to the right-hand side of your screen and clicking on the Q&A box. You will then be able to type in your questions, and at the end of the presentation, I will assist Justin and Zanandi in getting through as many questions uh, as time will allow. Please note that all attendees, apart from the presenter, have been muted to pre prevent any disruptions. A recording of this webinar will be made available for your convenience. Please be patient as we do, not, we do need to ensure that the recording is appropriately formatted for your viewing before we're able to send it to you. Lastly, if for any reason you experience a break in transmission or experience a poor network connection, please close down the app and log in again using the same details. I'll now hand you over to Justin and Zanande for their opening remarks and presentation. Justin and Zanande, good morning, and over to you. Hi, Jono, and uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to, to this webinar. Um, my name is uh, Justin Maloney, and uh, as John had mentioned, I'm a head of the Global Equity team. And I'll just take you, I'll just introduce first of all the Global Equity team. Um, so hopefully you can see the slide. So um, this Rhodes Gallery basically is, is the global team at uh, Melbourne Douglas, seven uh, experienced investment professionals. And our mandate is to manage the global equity strategies at Melbourne Douglas, which includes uh, the Melbourne Douglas Global Equity Fund, as well as segregated uh, portfolios. The way we manage money at Melbourne Douglas is, on a global basis, is to take a global sector point of view. So we don't allocate by by country, but by sector, uh, and by uh, actually by by the best opportunities across the globe. In terms of how we're organised um, as a team, uh, we have a global sector uh, responsibilities, and uh, for this particular. Uh, uh, seminar, I thought uh, it would be an ide ideal opportunity given that uh, information technology is a key theme in the markets, uh, not only at the moment, but uh, actually over the last several years or even uh, decade. Uh, um, it's my pleasure really to introduce uh, Zanande Meowa, who is our tech analyst. Zanande has been with us for uh, three years, um, and previously he was the uh, TMT analyst at HSBC. In terms of the agenda, uh, first of all, we'll just take a high-level view of technology, so forest from the tree type of approach, why technology, or in terms of the broader aspect, why innovation is such an important theme, or actually a more important theme today than it has been at any other time uh, in terms of investing. And uh, then, you know, once we tackle that, I'll pass you on to Zanande, who will focus on some of the opportunities that we are invested within our strategy. And also he'll cover some of the threats uh, that we're seeing in terms of the, uh, those particular opportunities and, and how we assess them. And finally, as John mentioned, there should be plenty of times, uh, time for your questions at the end. Let's just get started. So why technology or tech plus as we would call it? So as you know, we're, we're living through you know, quite interesting times at the moment. And indeed, from an investment standpoint, uh, we're seeing a huge amount of disruption, probably more so than at any other time, because in the past, you might have had disruption in a particular sector, but we're seeing it across the board. So, if, you know, classic examples are, you know, Amazon, how that's disrupted the high street re retailer. Uh, in transportation, you have Uber. Uh, within the film and media industry, it's, it's Netflix. Or even in lodging, you've got Airbnb, and and the list you know, goes on. So huge amount of disruption, and it's not just focused on one industry; it's across the board. Huge amount of disruption provides plenty of 
investment opportunity, but also poses a lot of risks. So as investors, and our, our, our objective really is to generate compound growth for our, our clients, is to ensure that we're protected and we, we, we capture those opportunities. How does, that, uh, how does one do that? Well, first of all, one ensures that you have a, um, a well-diversified portfolio uh, so that you can make allowance for the unexpected. And this particular slide highlights the diversification of the global equity strategy. So we are fairly concentrated in terms of the number of stocks that we hold in the portfolio. So out of a universe of around about 4,000 stocks, market capitalization above a billion dollars, we're in about 29 uh, companies today. But you can see they're spread across a number of different sectors, and that provides us with a level of diversification, uh, like I said, uh, for the unexpected. The other aspect is to ensure that you are invested in those companies that are more the disruptor rather than the disruptee. Uh, because there are a lot of companies out there that might look cheap, but they could be cheap for a reason because their markets are being, or their market share is being taken away by a new entrant. So diversification and also making sure we're in the right type of names. Now, the other thing I wanted to highlight in terms of our current positioning is the information technology sector, the technology sector broadly. Now, purely on a defin definition point of view, uh, in terms of the index compilers, we have around about 21% exposure to information technology. And I'll just highlight some of the names that we own. So within information technology, we have these five holdings. So we own Microsoft, and a lot of you, uh, you know, well, all of you should be aware of Microsoft. The interesting thing about Microsoft is that the business has really transformed itself over the last several years, and it's now a dominant player within cloud computing. So the, the whole dynamic of cloud computing is to shift the way that companies manage their computing power. So in the past, and, and also today, um, companies buy the hardware, they, they hire their own IT staff, and they install their own software. Um, and that's fine, but it's not the most flexible, more, most cost-effective way of, of um, managing your, your computing uh, resources. And what the cloud service providers do is that uh, companies can outsource a, a large element of their, their computing to the likes of a Microsoft or an Amazon Web Services. And there's a huge amount of growth uh, in terms of further outsourcing uh, from, a, from a cloud, uh, cloud um, outsourcing point of view. So that's uh, Microsoft. We also are invested, and in, interestingly, Visa MasterCard are defined as, as technology companies uh, by the MSCI World Index, but they, you know, so they're defined as technology companies. And these companies clearly play the shift from paying for things by cash and check to digital means of payment. And the key driver of that is, is obviously e-commerce and enabling, enabling technology. So you know, they, they really are dominant players within that particular space. The other two companies are hardware companies, Amphenol and Chaos, and they're more behind the scenes players. So Amphenol, um, basically what they do is they provide components or connectors in a wide range of different uh, devices, electronical devices, whether it's in the car, the home, uh, the office, um, or in your smartphone. They provide these little uh, bespoke connectors. And so crucial elements within electric devices. And they provide thousands of these different bespoke products. So they're very diversified. They're not one player on a particular technology. And their play is really the increasing digitization of um, use of electronics uh, broadly. And finally, Kaons is a Japanese vision sensor company. It's to enable automation within factory, within factory floors. So that, that's the, the technology element of our portfolio is to finally uh, uh, defined. Um, but if you broadened your definition of technology to other sectors, like I said, new entrants and disruptors, then what you define as technology in terms of our exposure is much broader. So not 20%, but actually more close to 50% of our portfolio are in technology type companies. So let me just run through it. So within consumer discretionary, so consumer discretionary, uh, you know, historically has been the retailing companies, automobile companies, uh, those type of things. But uh, 
Also within that categorization are the likes of these e-commerce players such as Amazon and Alibaba. I won't steal Zanandi's funder because he'll talk about this a little bit later, uh, but they're, they're also defined within that, that space. Then communication services, traditionally that, that was the telecoms and old media companies, but it also includes new media such as Alphabet, Facebook and Tencent. So we also own those companies. And finally, even in industrials and business services, you can find technology oriented companies such as Verisk and Experian. They're both big database companies that provide mission critical data for uh, the financial services sector. But you could, you could even broaden it further out, whether it's healthcare, you know, there's some interesting robotic companies within that space in terms of surgery, or financial services undergoing a lot of disruption. We see this trend uh, expanding, and, and the growth is really, as I said, with the disruptor with, rather than the disruptee. So that's the theme, but we're not, we're not necessarily theme investors, we're fundamental investors. And so this is where this quote from uh, Willie Sutton, you know, that's where the money is. Is there actually money behind this theme? Now, Willie Sutton, many of you might recall, is a famous or celebrity 1920s, 1930s bank robber. He used to go uh, dress up in disguises, didn't use any bullets in his guns, apparently. Um, and so he's a famous bank robber. And when he was asked the obvious question by a journalist, why did you um, rob all these banks? And he said, that's where the money is. So, Crucially, we, we need to understand that when we're investing. And for us, actually, in the broader definition of tech, tech plus, the tech plus is information technology, plus those e-commerce companies, plus those internet companies. As you can see from this chart, um, those companies have, have had superior growth than the S&P 500 X those companies, the X tech companies. So the S&P 500 is the top 500 companies in the United States, if you exclude those technology companies, you can see that you know uh, sales have grown over time, but it's been a lot more at a lot more sedate pace. So that's the top line, plenty of sales growth, but has it translated into profits? And the answer is yes. So as you can see on this right-hand chart, technology profit margins have expanded over time, um, and again, particularly over the last decade. Well, meanwhile, interestingly, that copper line. The profit margins for companies excluding those new growth companies has actually declined slightly over the last 25 years, probably because they're facing a lot more competition and, and their underlying markets are slowing, the less offer operational leverage. So that's where the profits are, that's where the growth is, but you're probably asking the question, is that all in the price? And you would have been absolutely correct about that assumption uh, 20 years ago, during the dot-com era, the year 2000, when valuations were through the roof. So this chart is, again, the top 500 US companies, and it's the price to earnings ratio for those companies broken down by sector in the year 2000. And what you can see from these bars is that um, there was a big disparity between information technology company valuations and the rest of uh, the market. And at that time, there was a lot of hype and valuation metrics had changed. So uh, investors were coming up with new and novel ways of uh, valuing companies. There's nothing to do with fundamentals, such as uh, counting the number of eyeballs and things like that, and putting a, a multiple on that. What's the situation today? So if we pan forward to today, you can see those copper lines. So there's copper bars are the price to earnings ratios for those various sectors today. And you can see that the technology sector, there isn't much of disparity. Yes, they are trading at a little bit of a premium compared to other sectors, but we feel that that premium is deserved because you're getting that higher sales growth, higher level of profitability. And actually what this chart points out is that the bubble is not necessarily in, in technology valuations, it's in other parts of the market. In particular, those bond proxies. So think about real estate, utilities, um, you know, th th those sort of sectors that generate, have historically generated high dividend yields uh, and steady dividend yields. And the reason why those valuations have, have ratcheted up is because there is a bubble in the bond market supported by quantitative easing and investors seeking yield have gone into what they perceive are lower risk equities uh, delivering a, a nice yield in terms of dividend. 
So the, the valuation is, is stretched of, in terms of those sectors, but we don't think it's overstretched within IT. So with that, that's the overall thematics in terms of tech investing. And at this stage, I'd like to pass you on to Zanande. Uh, <clears throat> good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, thank you for that introduction, Justin. Uh, so my name is Zanande Meiwa, as uh, my colleague Justin uh, rightly pointed out. And I look after the global tech uh, space within Marvel Douglas. So essentially today, I'll be taking you through some of the opportunities that we see in the space. That's essentially uh, cement our view and excite us about some of the opportunities that we see within the space. Uh, these will uh, mainly be within uh, the e-commerce as well as digital um, advertising. And then uh, thereafter, we'll uh, take you through um, how we look at uh, valuation, uh, given how large our universe is. And then um, after that, we'll touch on some of the threats uh, that we're seeing within the space. Um, including the risks and how we think about that. And then after um, um, doing so, I'll hand over to my colleague, Justin, who will provide us with um, a summary of uh, our discussion today. So suppose maybe uh, without further ado, and looking at the first opportunity that excites us um, is within the e-commerce space. I'm sure uh, many of us would relate to uh, the illustration that we see on the left. Um, so say for example, um, not even for example, I mean, most of us, uh, before COVID-19, um, whenever we needed something, um, whether it be a cell phone or a laptop or stocking up on essent uh, one or two uh, household essentials, we'd pop down at our local shopping center or convenience store and get those. But then COVID hit um, and most of us were forced uh, into shelter in place measures, uh, which were introduced by various governments. And uh, quite a lot of us probably turned um, to the online. Um, from a South Africa perspective, think your step delivery, food, your Uber Eats, as well as your take a lot. Uh, from a US perspective, I think your Amazons and the likes, which saw quite uh, a rapid uh, growth from a sales perspective. Um, so uh, COVID brought in quite a uh, massive pull forward from an e-commerce perspective. Um, however, uh, looking ahead and uh, in a post uh, COVID uh, more normalized world, we think that uh, a lot of uh, the behavior uh, that has shifted towards online or that has been in, in, induced by COVID-19 will largely stick. Um, so that's largely illustrated by the chart on the left, on, on the right-hand side. Um, so you can see in 2019, uh, e-commerce penetration from a global perspective was sitting at 14%. COVID came um, and that accelerated quite a lot of adoption uh, from an e-commerce perspective. Moving forward in 2025, uh, we expect uh, e-commerce penetration relative to overall retail sales uh, to jump to 25%. Uh, so that clearly shows that there's still quite a lot of, a lot of room uh, for growth, even despite the fact that there's been a pull forward uh, in e-commerce sales. And how we play this space uh, is uh, through both Alibaba as well as Amazon. Uh, and uh, what we like about these two counters is the fact that one, they're quite innovative. Um, and two, they uh, have quite uh, incredible cash genera uh, generation um, capabilities. And they've, uh, in, each of, in, in each of the industries that they've gone into, they've uh, introduced quite a lot of disruptions. And I suppose maybe the one key ingredient um, that we like, um, and I suppose it plays into the modes of both these companies is the fact that they use um, data to inform a lot of uh, the delivery capabilities, um, et cetera. So within that respect, we think these two players uh, will largely capture um, quite a large piece of the pie um, within the e-commerce space um, from a global perspective. And another exciting theme um, that uh, I would like uh, would like to uh, chat to is within the digital advertising space. So there's been quite a lot of um, uh, disruption that has happened over the years within the space. Uh, previously, we used to look at classifieds and newspapers. Now those have increasingly moved over to your, your Facebook shops or your um, your Facebook marketplace, where you can essentially search for an old couch um, on this platform. Um, for example, uh, if you look at Google, if you Google the pair of running shoes. Um, you probably actually just see uh, maybe a week from now, maybe two days from now, uh, quite a variety of options that are displayed across some of the uh, websites that you visit, which essentially highlight a lot of um, various options within the running shoe uh, category. So we play uh, digital advertising through uh, both the uh, all, across all four players, and now more recently through Amazon. So if you think Facebook, uh, Facebook on a monthly basis reaches about uh, two thirds of the global population. On a daily basis, it reaches about a third. Um, 
your, your, the likes of your Googles uh, through YouTube, they've got about 2 billion monthly active users um, who use their platforms on a, day, on, a, on a monthly basis. You look at your Tencent within the China market, uh, Tencent reaches about 1.2 uh, billion odd uh, monthly active users, um, and then Alibaba just shy of a billion. So we play our digital advertising through a lot of these, uh, uh, through these players. And within this space, we anticipating quite a um, strong growth as well as um, increasing penetration from a digital advertising perspective. Where this growth is expected to come from um, is from two, uh, two places mainly, one being uh, GDP growth. Um, as uh, in, uh, we see um, um, uh, 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 that GDP growth come through, which is highly correlated uh, to um, um, advertising growth, uh, these players should also benefit. And I suppose a large portion of uh, the advertising should also come from um, the digital advertising players stealing away market share from you, uh, the likes of your traditional advertising, being your newspaper, prints, your magazines, as well as in your TV. Um, one um, example that I usually make to the team in order to submit this view is uh, whenever I watch linear TV, I always get served um, nappy ads. And I mean, I don't have a child yet, but I've never bought a nappy in my life. Whereas if I go into YouTube, um, I usually get served um, advertise, uh, advertisements, which relate to gaming. Whenever I go on, 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 on Google, I usually get served advertisements uh, related to sneakers, uh, given that um, I quite do uh, like uh, a nice pair of sneakers here and there. Uh, so within that respect, we see quite a lot of growth uh, uh, to come through, still to come from these players. Um, if you look at Facebook as well as Alphabet, um, these companies or Google, um, they capture about 60% of global um, advertising, uh, digital advertising market. Uh, so there's still quite a lot of room for growth and uh, that gives us quite a lot of comfort as well as conviction across a lot of these names, uh, including the Chinese names as well, which are also quite posed. Uh, poised for, for, for incredible growth uh, moving forward from a digital advertising perspective. Now, um, essentially how we think about um, valuation, as uh, my colleague Justin um, had touched on earlier on, um, we've got quite a broad universe from a global perspective um, and our style is um, we look for quality at a reasonable price and um, which is illustrated quite nicely by the chart that you see uh, before you. Uh, essentially the way in which to think about this chart is um, a lot of the names below the red line are essentially cheap uh, and are delivering quite uh, um, strong growth. And a lot of the names that are above uh, the, the trend line, the red trend line, are essentially quite expensive. So you're paying up for a lot of the growth. So as you can see, uh, a lot of our tech names largely fall uh, below that uh, red trend line. Um, and uh, given uh, the wide universe uh, that we look at, um, we um, to look for quality businesses with moats, as Justin had pointed out, and where uh, largely the money lies uh, from the, and, and plus not uh, not to paying up uh, for, 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 for the growth. I mean, if you look at the likes of your Teslas, um, yes, you're getting quite a bit of growth coming in, uh, but then that growth is largely coming from a small base, plus you're paying up uh, quite a bit um, in order to capture that growth. Um, so having said, I suppose it's worth touching on some of the risks. Um, within the space that we've seen over the past couple of months, uh, perhaps over uh, the past couple of uh, two years um, as well. I'm sure most of us have uh, seen quite a lot of these headlines. Um, so from a risk perspective, uh, there's been quite a few developments over both in the US as well as China. From an antitrust perspective, we saw quite a lot of investigations uh, being launched over in the US. We saw an investigation recently that was launched against Alibaba which saw the company getting fined over $2.7 billion uh, for violating um, anti-monopoly laws over in China. Um, and we, there are ongoing investigations um, um, with some of the large tech names um, in, in the US. Certainly a lot of these headlines have given me quite um, um, a few sleepless nights. There's also been uh, regulation that's also uh, increasingly uh, taken up uh, quite a lot of uh, the headlines, um, especially from a data security perspective. You see the GDPR Act uh, being introduced or enacted over in Europe. And also, I suppose, uh, the one big uh, regulation that we should also take cognizance of, or cognizance of is uh, the, the China as well as US um, uh, tensions um, that uh, every now and then pop up um, and uh, do have a little bit of an effect um, from a regulatory perspective. Um, so having said, uh, listed a lot of these, we've uh, done quite extensive consultation with various legal experts across both geographies, being China as well as the US, 
um, including other regions. And uh, from our holding, we gain comfort from the fact that one, um, from a China perspective, as much as uh, there was an investigation uh, um, that was launched against Alibaba, which left the company having to pay quite a massive fine, uh, the nice thing about the company is that uh, a lot of uh, uh, what it, the company is doing or a lot of the objectives that the company is pursuing are largely in line with the objective of the regulator. Um, yes, the company did violate a lot of the fines, but at the same time, um, Alibaba uh, was recognized by the Chinese president for having quite um, um, a helping hand in alleviating a lot of the um, uh, poverty um, over on that side of the world. And uh, having looked at uh, some of the uh, regulations that have been recently introduced, um, a lot of them uh, do not seek, we, we believe, uh, based on our consultation as well as our, our research, um, seek to break up uh, these Chinese companies. And then over in the US, um, there's quite a robust legal system, which has been in place for years. And uh, what uh, gives us a little bit of comfort is the fact that it would be quite difficult to break up a lot of these names, um, even despite the fact that some politicians may be calling for breakups. Uh, so the legal um, or the judiciary uh, from a U.S. perspective uh, is largely factual based and that does give us a degree of comfort that um, it will be quite an onerous uh, task uh, to break up any of the, the big tech platforms um, in the U.S. And uh, so um, having said, I'd like to hand over to my uh, colleague, Justin, who will provide a, a, a summary and concluding remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Zanande. So just uh, as Zanande mentioned, just a, a quick sort of uh, three, three takeaways from the presentation. Uh, first of all is to consider the disruptiveness of uh, recent innovations when investing. Um, with that, there is a price for everything. We're fundamental investors, and it is very easy to be caught up in the hype, but there's also plenty of opportunity out there. And finally, you know, as active investors, it's all about sifting uh, the risks from the noise. There is uh, a lot of greed and fear in the market, and we do a lot of homework to ensure that we can capture the opportunities as they're presented. Uh, with that, I will uh, now pass you back to Jono, who will uh, handle, handle the, the questions and answers. Justin and Zanande, thank you so much. Uh, for that uh, amazing presentation, very topical at the moment, um, technology being a, a massive space. And I'm sure that, uh, Justin, I'm sure a lot of the audience weren't aware that, uh, that obviously that the IT, traditional IT names, Facebook and Amazon sitting in consumer discretionary, et cetera. Um, so 50% so of our fund making, making up kind of technology kind of companies. And uh, quite interesting to note that the, the likes of Walmart 20 years ago um, it was very different to the Walmart now. Now you've got the Amazon, the big disruptor in that kind of space. So you're seeing it a lot. We're seeing a massive sell-off in the markets this week in China with Tencent um, and, and Alibaba coming off sub substantially. Um, so I think the, the, the question on everybody's mind at the moment is, 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 is what does this mean uh, for Tencent? Um, and, and, and that's the major, the, you know, the, the, main, the main question we, we kind of we have today is what does this mean for us? Do we see this as a buying opportunity? Um, uh, do we see the regulator uh, in China um, kind of um, coming to terms with uh, with everything and basically loosening up their restrictions? And and then also, um, do we see this as a major buying opportunity as well? So Zanandi, I think I'll hand the question over to you, um, uh, please. Sure. Uh, thanks, John, for that question. Um, it's actually a really, really good question. Um, I mean, uh, taking a little bit of a step back um, and looking at the China um, regulations, a lot of it uh, have uh, a lot of uh, what's happening at the moment has uh, largely um, started off with uh, 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 and financial IPO. Then immediately after that, a series of draft regulations were introduced, and then this year we saw quite um, a spate of other regulations that which have been introduced which I suppose um, have spooked quite a lot of investors, hence uh, we, uh, the, the recent sell-off from a lot of the China names. However, uh, across both Tencent as well as Alibaba, we think uh, these, these names are largely uh, uh, are champions, uh, China uh, champions over in China. And we don't think the regulator is seeking to break up uh, these companies or um, harm a lot of uh, the profitability. Like for example, if you look at the fine that was levied at Alibaba, 
Um, it, there wasn't any uh, major structural changes uh, from, from a company perspective, which hinders their path to growth. Uh, essentially, what the regulator had wanted was um, a lot of uh, the spillover effects that these companies have from a subsidy perspective, especially from a food delivery as well as um, online sales, not to spill over into the real economy. And then uh, from a China, uh, from a Tencent perspective, there hasn't really been anything uh, major that has been announced, uh, which uh, might hinder or um, um, disrupt uh, the company. Um, there was recent news flow that came through um, uh, last week, uh, which essentially highlighted the fact that um, Tencent has barred new user registrations. We think, uh, uh, in our view, is, uh, is that Tencent is largely uh, seeking to comply with a lot of the new uh, data laws that have been introduced from a China perspective. Uh, so within our view, um, we don't think the regulator over in China is seeking to uh, break up these companies or hinder uh, the part to profitability. Uh, but essentially, it, uh, the, the regulator is seeking uh, a more uh, balanced approach, um, which doesn't hinder your traditional mom and pop stores. Um, even if I can extend that example over to the education um, sector, which is what's announced uh, a lot of the draft rules. Um, yeah, um, a lot of uh, what was introduced by the uh, by the government is largely in line uh, with uh, the communist uh, party values, uh, where education is a public good and it should be treated as such and uh, it shouldn't be monetized. So within that respect, I, um, I think uh, that China is largely catching up with uh, the rest of the world from a regulatory perspective, given that uh, they have, hadn't uh, regulated these platforms, and we think that uh, they're not seeking to disrupt or uh, hinder the performance of a lot of these platforms, given that they are, well, are national champions from uh, innovation as well as uh, an employment and technological uh, advancement uh, perspective. Great, Sananda. Thank you very much for that answer. Um, so we do see this as a, as a buying opportunity from, a, from, from your point of view? Uh, yes, I, I neglected to answer that, forgot to answer that. Yes, definitely. Um, I mean, both across Alibaba as well as Tencent, we think it's a compelling opportunity at current levels. I mean, if you look at Tencent, Tencent's currently trading at around the 22 times. If you were to strip away some of the listed associates, it's probably trading within the teens. Uh, Alibaba, the core commerce business, is also trading at uh, very, very modest, uh, inexpensive levels. So, yeah, definitely we say um, it is a buying opportunity um, uh, at, at, at current levels. Fantastic. Thank you, Zanande. So um, uh, we we obviously have another question. Are we are we in China? The answer is yes, we are in China. We have Tencent and and and, um, and Alibaba uh, within our portfolio. Um, I think uh, the next question, uh, just the second question to that, is is basically uh, to Justin. Uh, do we see the emerging market uh, run over? Do we see do we do we see the emerging market run uh, stock stock market run over, being over? Um, in terms of the index run, so uh, yes, yeah, so to put it in perspective, obviously coming out of the uh, the first uh, um, space of lockdowns early last year, you obviously had a big uh, recovery in cyclically sensitive stocks as, uh, you know, central banks across the globe and also governments intervened and supported uh, those economies and to tide us through this pandemic. So there's been a big big recovery from the bottom in terms of uh, economically sensitive stocks, and clearly the emerging markets, having been sold off, uh, bounced quite strongly. Um, is the emerging emerging market rally over? That's a difficult thing to tell. Uh, tell. We're not timing experts. Um, is the emerging market trade over in terms of secular growth opportunity? We don't think so. So in terms of how we're structured, uh, we've got to listed stocks. About 10% of our portfolio is in uh, listed emerging market stocks, and that's Chinese and also Indian companies. But interestingly, we, and we've done a see-through analysis, if you break down the companies we're invested in, and we're invested in a, in a large number of multinational companies, you break it down by the, where they generate the revenues. Our overall portfolio is about 34% exposed to emerging markets. Um, at, you know, compared, so 10% in listed emerging market companies, about a third in revenue exposure. Um, part of the reason is the corporate governance and the quality of a lot of these multinationals draws us to be invested in uh, companies that are, are, that are quoted in, in, in America or, or London rather than their local exchanges. 
Um, and the companies such as, say, Starbucks. Starbucks is, does generate a lot of revenues from the United States, but their second largest opportunity is China. And they're seeing rapid ex expansion as the Chinese consumer, uh, you know, grows. Uh, the middle class in China grows as that economy uh, moves forward. So the structure of the recovery might be different. So we've had those infrastructure build outs, a lot of consumption in terms of, say, the raw material mining uh, resource companies. They've benefited and they will continue to benefit, but it's broadened out. Uh, the opportunity in emerging markets to, to other aspects of the economy, as I said, the consumer side, and investing actually in a lot of these multinational companies, they actually a lot of them are are well positioned to benefit from from that trend. So timing wise, it's anyone's call short term in terms of the macro data in eleven flow, but we we we, we do ensure we have a, a good exposure to to the underlying growth. Great, thanks, thanks a lot, Justin, for that uh, for that answer. Um, just another one. While we while we you mentioned resource stocks, etc., um, a question uh, from 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 one of the one of the audience members is basically, do we have uh, resource exposure? Uh, if we uh, don't, why not? Yes, um, we we do have some resource exposure, but it's it has to fit our process and philosophy. So the way we invest and our underlying philosophy is to capture long-term compound returns. I've mentioned diversification, but we also, the type of companies that we're, we're biased in, that we seek are, are companies that can consistently deliver, uh, you know, healthy free cash flow uh, through a cycle. And so we're naturally drawn to companies with slightly less cyclicality, uh, that have less uh, capital intensity, I uh, didn't spend a lot on fixed uh, capital, and you see these wild swings particularly, uh, for example, in the mining sector. Um, in terms of resources exposure, we don't have anything in fossil fuels. We haven't had anything in fossil fuels for uh, about four or five years. It's for structural reasons, not necessarily a call on the oil price. And we know, you know, there'll be times when there'll be the favoured sector. But structurally, we see that uh, that particular industry struggling, and we've got better opportunities elsewhere. We do have mining companies on our watch list. So we have a watch list of about 100 to 120 names. We've got the Anglos, the Rio Tintos, BHPs on our watch list, but we just got better opportunities and materials. We're, we're global investors, so we don't, we're not just restricted to those companies uh, in, in the mining sector, even though it's an important sector within South Africa. So in, within materials, we've got, um, we've got Brent, Brentag, which is a, a multinational, it's a German headquartered chemicals distributor. So they benefit from, uh, obviously, uh, ongoing demand for chemicals has actually been a great performer over the last 12 months when you've had that cyclical recovery. But the good thing is they're middlemen, so they don't, they, they, um, they, uh, they don't, there's, the capital intensity is quite low for that business. There's plenty of growth. Um, it's well diversified, but captures the uh, economy uh, in, in the way that we like. And that, one other company that we have in the material sector is Linde, which is a leading industrial gas company. Uh, so they basically sell out air. <laughs> they condense air, you know, uh, and sell it. So free commodity. Uh, but obviously, there's, a, there's more to the story than that. But uh, that's interesting. Uh, interesting thematically in terms of that there'll be a leader, leading player in hydrogen. But again, it's it's a great business model. Um, they do capture the upside in uh, in the economic cycle, but they do deliver uh, decent returns through uh, through through it as well. Uh, so hopefully that gives, gives you a flavour in terms of what we invest in. Yes, perfect, Justin. Thank you so much uh, for your for your answer on that question. Um, I think uh, the next question, um, uh, uh, Zanande, I think you presented with regards to Apple um, uh, looking re reasonably inexpensive on your chart. Um, I think mm -hmm. uh, from a question from one of our audience members is basically when Apple pulled back to $120 a share. Uh, a couple of months ago, did you did you consider it? Is it something that you're watching? Um, uh, uh, you know, as 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 Marvel Douglas. Um, so if you could just basically comment on that, please. Thanks. Sure. Thanks, John. Um, that's a great question. Um, Apple is one of the names that uh, is largely within our radar and that we're actively watching. Um, we have looked at the name. However, um, uh, from a valuation perspective, as much as it does look cheap on the chart that I presented. Um, we have to take uh, cognizance of the fact that um, the chart that I did present is largely on a, um, 
on a, a financial year basis and not necessarily on a calendar year basis. So uh, if you look at the, the current period that we're in at the moment, Apple is largely facing quite a, a large uh, comps on the back of shelter in place and the strong demand for a lot of its products. And then um, uh, on 12 months forward, uh, the base does look um, quite easy. So optically, it does look cheap. Um, however, at the at, at current prices, we think it's, 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 it's quite pricey. We don't think it's a bad business. Um, however, we do have a little bit of um, concerns in just a few areas, and we're closely watching the, uh, the, the company's valuation and a nice, uh, suppose maybe entry point uh, into, into into the play. Um, although that we we would not mark market timers, um, but I suppose maybe the one thing that does concern us a bit from Apple perspective is we've done a little bit of an exercise uh, where we looked at we tracked a lot of uh, Apple's EPS growth, and a lot of it were largely was largely driven by share buybacks, uh, given the fact that um, a lot of um, the high margin product, uh, mainly being the iPhone, um, is largely dwindling uh, from a mixed perspective. And that's obviously affected gross margins as well as uh, the operating margin. Um, that does give us a sense of worry. Um, and, the, and also at the same time, in order for Apple to upsell a lot of its services, you do need that um, iPhone to pick up. Uh, so those are the, just some of the concerns that we have. Um, however, we don't think it's a bad business. We think it's a good business. Uh, it might have a bit of growth, but then I suppose maybe from a pricing perspective, we just um, would rather stay on the sidelines for now until we think it's reasonably, it's at a, um, um, a reasonably priced level, uh, which yeah, I suppose maybe uh, the same um, level of approach we apply with a lot of our companies looking for quality at a reasonable price. Fantastic. Thank you, Zanande. Um, and, and just uh, anything that you've been buying um, buying or selling this year activity within the portfolio, any kind of pipeline ideas that you guys are looking at? Um, Zananda, maybe I can start with you and then maybe go over to Justin or Zananda, you can ask the question, then, then, then that's fine. But if you can just, uh, just give us some uh, idea of what you guys are looking at, um, what we've sold, um, what we've bought, etc. Sure, I suppose maybe taking a little bit of a step back. Um, so last year, uh, we took quite a prudent approach. Uh, we robustly debated this across the team um, at the height of uh, the regulatory regulations uh, over in the US when there were, uh, was an announcement that Facebook as well as Alphabet were being investigated. So what we did was um, with the team debated that we should rather, rather trim um, our exposure uh, to Alphabet and then use those funds in, um, in order to invest in, 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 in Facebook. Um, in order to mitigate uh, a lot of the risks, given that a lot of the investigations were quite uh, different across both players. Uh, that strategy has largely played off, um, and we have made some handsome returns. Uh, we also have been looking at the China space and nibbling here and there uh, with your likes of Alibaba, as well as um, uh, your Tencent, given um, current valuations. Um, but yeah, if I've missed out anything, Justin, uh, please feel free to add as well. Um, yeah, um, Zananda basically summarized uh, our approach. Our approach is not to turn over the portfolio uh, a lot. Um, you know, the, the, the stocks we own are our are best ideas as long-term compounders. And the mistake a lot of investors, that we're called active investors, but it's a definition of active. So what's the definition of active? Is it hyperactive? where you feel you need to be reacting to every dig in the market, or is it active in terms of what we see? We're pretty active, like I said earlier on, that we we currently hold, we we hold between 25 and 35 stocks, and our universe is 4,000. So, you know, um, there will be time, there will always be stocks that um, clients be wondering why we didn't own it, because it's done very well. Um, we just got to focus on what, we think fits our strategy the best as a long-term investor, three to five year time horizon. On saying that, we do have actually quite a long pipeline list. Um, so we have about uh, 15 to 12, 15, about 15 ideas that the team is looking at at the moment uh, in terms of potential opportunities. And the reason for that, none of them, they may all come to naught. We might decide actually what we currently hold uh, is the best portfolio, but it's to ensure that we, we don't become stale and we don't just sit on our laurels. Uh, and so 
I'm not sure if I should mention them, but um, I mean, there's, there's, I'll mention one that uh, might end up being uh, very expensive, <laughs> uh, and that's PayPal. So I, I'm currently um, looking at that as an opportunity. Uh, a, a lot of you probably know PayPal. It's that button on, on the e-commerce site originally, um, and people still use it because they're worried about putting their credit card details on not necessarily Amazon, but a website that no one's heard of. Um, so it, it provides that security protection. But as they've grown, they basically have this double-sided network whereby merchants want PayPal on their on their site because basically if there's a PayPal button on the site, they get 30% extra sales. And people want PayPal because it's actually a predominant payment system uh, on, on e-commerce. So it's a great great opportunity, but they've expanded from, from just doing that to seeing themselves as a, as a digital wallet. So providing a, a broad range of financial services. And we think that's where a lot of the financial sector is going to go over the long run. So There's great opportunity. It's quite pricey. Um, we're going to do the work. I've done, done a bit of work already. We're going to do the work. But that's an idea, for example, that we have on the sidelines. I mentioned we have a monitor list of 100 or 120 names. Uh, we've got a 30, a 30 stock portfolio. We're working on new ideas. So visibly, it may look like we're not doing much in terms of portfolio, but there's a lot of activity going around around the edges. Fantastic. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Zanandi, for that for that answer. Uh, I'd love to know what other uh, what other ideas uh, you have in the pipeline, Justin. But I'm sure um, that's pretty much on a need to know basis. Um, so, um, uh, so, so just with regards to the market in general. Um, you know, Zananda, you were talking about uh, the, the the kind of valuations being um, uh, not too pricey on the on the tech side, etc. Um, but is the market in general expensive? Justin, maybe I could uh, uh, hand a question over to you. Is the market too expensive? Uh, so, you know, so valuations on tech are looking cheaper than normal, um, or is it is is it you know it, is is the market generally fair value at the moment? What what are your thoughts? Yeah, value question because the uh, the um, the world index is up ninety nine. I'm not saying nine one nine nine zero percent from the bottom uh, last year. So uh, everyone's out, you know with fresh money do do you invest in the market? And our, our view is we're, we're actually maximum overweight in terms of our multi asset portfolios. Why is that? Because earnings has come up. Earnings is coming through, and also rates are low. So let me explain. Um, the S and P 500 index is trading at 21 times uh, forward earnings. It was trade today. It was trading at 21 times forward earnings a year ago, um, and yet the market up 90% since the, the lows in, in February. But um, since last summer, the market is up 40%, but earnings is up 40% as well. So it's actually been quite rational. The market it's gone up in line with that big move up in earnings. And we see actually earnings continuing to, to deliver. Um, and we've just had, a, 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 we're currently in, in, in reporting season at the moment for, for Q, Q2 numbers, we're seeing a, um, a high level of earnings growth. So we're going to see that continue to go, go through. There's a lot of uh, support, uh, like I said, um, from, from, from governments, it's reopening. So it's a natural element that uh, good quality companies will just prevent to do business, reopening, they'll, they'll do business, they'll, they'll have a pick up in earnings. So earnings growth coming through. The other element in terms of not being cheaper expensive is the level of interest rates. So level of uh, level of rates are much lower than they were 10 years ago. The average um, uh, valuation for the S&P 500 is about 16 to 16 and a half times. I said it's 21 times, but that's on, on a, a much higher level of interest rates. Yes, rates are going to go up a bit, but we don't see them going back to 10-year average levels anytime soon. That just tries a higher valuation level. You've got a combination of earnings growth coming through, um, rates here up a bit, but still ultra low, uh, supporting valuations. Um, and then where else can you invest? Well, in terms of developed markets, you can earn, uh, you know, zero, uh, you can earn slightly over 1% if you're buying, buying U.S. Uh, long-dated 10-year uh, bonds, next to zero. Uh, if you're putting your money in cash, uh, whereby you can get a, a dividend yield of uh, you know slightly under two percent uh, on um, on in, in global equities, plus you've got that growth and you've got that inflation protection. So 
it's uh, there is there is a clear clear advantage in terms of owning equities versus other asset classes. So, so for all of those uh, reasons, um, I think the market's probably got further to go. We've had virtually no correction since this current rally. There will be volatility along the way. Uh, that's part of markets. I've done an analysis of two out of every three years over the last 40 years. You've had 10% correction. Expect a 10% correction. That's how markets react. Uh, so expect that. But um, you know, in terms of a two or three year time horizon, I would stay invested. Great. Very, very. Thanks very much for your answer, Justin. Um, so um, when you're saying you've got over three year time horizon, um, what is your long term view on, on 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 basically global equities? Do we see? You know, we've obviously had a, an amazing five years in our global equity fund. Um, obviously, the tech names have, have, have rewarded everybody over the last 10 years who've been in, in them. But but what do we kind of forecast over the next five year period? Do we do we need to kind of um, kind of lower our expectations a little bit? Um, uh, and yeah, what do you what? I know that you don't have a crystal ball, but what do you foresee in terms of returns over the next five years? Yeah, nicely teed up, Jono. So exactly that, because <laughs> um, over the last five years, you've generated 15% per annum returns investing in, in our in our global equity fund. Um, but let, let, let's be realistic. Uh, over the last 50 years, you've generated between seven to eight percent on global equities per annum. So we've had double the, the rate of return over the last five years than you've had on average. Um, so ba you know, use that as your base, seven to eight percent when you're planning. And um, is that achievable? Yes, because uh, if you assume that um, if you assume that uh, GDP will grow at um, global GDP will can grow at real rates of about three percent per annum over the next ten years, inflation of about two percent that gives you a nominal uh, GDP growth of five percent. Um, earnings roughly grow around about the level of the economy, and historically, U.S. earnings have grown about six percent. But let's say take five percent. Add a dividend yield of two percent, you get to about seven percent return. So that's just a bit of an equation there, but essentially there's a fundamental backing for why returns on global equity should be around about seven uh, percent on average. Of course, you'll have years when it's double that, and years when it might even be a negative number. But that for for a ten-year uh, time horizon, I said three, but ten years, you know, because there's cycles. Um, seven to eight percent return for planning for, the, for for your savings is is probably the better number to use. Obviously, we'll we'll, we'll look to beat that number. That's that's the overall market um, as as uh, you know because we're, we're an active uh, fund. But uh, that that's that's the that's the benchmark. Fantastic. So we we're looking anywhere between seven eight percent on a kind of a, an index basis, but obviously at an active manager basis, we'd like to do ten percent, eleven percent. Uh, you know, <laughs> over the next five years, no pressure. But, um, but uh, yeah, I, think next, <laughs> I think the next question um, that's obviously top of mind, and before we end off, because we've only got a, a, a few a few minutes left, um, is uh, for Zanande. And I think um, you know we talk about ten cent, and we've chatted a lot about Chinese regulation, etc. And I think the question on everybody's mind today. Is NASPAS process, which is the big corporate action coming uh, coming up. So, um, what would our recommendation be to clients? Um, I know we are doing a separate presentation on that, but just a quick one. Um, uh, now that we're seeing where Tencent is trading, um, what do you propose? Um, yeah, it's a, uh, it's a very good uh, question, uh, Jono. Uh, would implore or recommend uh, to our clients that uh, they tender their shares. Okay, fantastic. Zanande, thank you so much. Right, Justin and Zanande, thank you so much for your time. Um, very valuable um, insight uh, into the tech sector, into the Global Equity Fund. Um, thank you very much for your time today, everybody on the line. Um, I wish you a pleasant day. Stay safe. Take care.